In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's one of those odd things, those of us that are part of, part of the Church of England, we assume that uh, everybody does and says the same thing as us every week, and we've got just these two main sets of services. But as we move around the parishes, this is probably the first time that I've actually done a morning prayer on a Sunday morning, this style. Um, if not ever, certainly for some time, I'm familiar with it during the week. Those of you who've seen on Facebook, I do morning and evening prayer at uh, St Mary's Halesworth. But uh, using this on a Sunday, mainly I guess because as clergy we tend towards the Holy Communion services rather than the morning prayers. Good to see you all and it's also good to have um, the bell ringers here welcoming as they make their way round the various parishes of the two benefices as they are able. So, to our readings. Our first, the, the Nighty, Come, let us worship. O come, let us sing to the Lord. As uh, you may know, in the Roman tradition, the um, songs, canticles, readings, documents are labelled or named after the first word or two um, of the document or of the poem. A little bit like us trying to think of the title for a hymn, whereas actually it's just the first line. And uh, so Psalm 95 has passed into um, a sort of litur liturgical vocabulary as a canticle. It opens morning prayer on Friday in common worship. And it's also known as well as Psalm 95, therefore, as the Vanity. O come, let us sing to the Lord. And it's a good psalm with which to open our worship, an encouragement to sing to God. Worship to bow down, and why? Because in his hands are the depths of the earth, and the heights of the mountains are his also. God is over all things and under all things, just as we heard in the Song of Songs. His left hand is under my head, his right hand embraced me. I have gone down into his cellar. Just looking for that... Uh, Looking for the cellar reference. But at any rate, there are expressions of being below and above. He stands like a gazelle, um, looking through the lattice. That would be high up and left and right hand above and below. There is an embrace of God's love. This Song of Solomon um, is like the Psalms. It's a poem. Uh, it sits in the scriptures as we generally have them with the Hebrew scriptures and the second covenant in the wisdom section the poetry section wisdom that expression of God called Sophia the spirit the Holy Ghost the Holy Spirit and there's a body of writing in that Hebrew scripture which is poetic if you're the sort of person who likes facts and figures I suggest you dip your toe in the water, but don't spend too much time there. You might rather read the histories, which again are somewhat metaphorical, but uh, the second chunk after the Torah are the histories. The Torah is the law, and then we have the prophecies. So they're all the sections of the Hebrew scripture. But this wisdom section, it takes some gentle reading, and one needs to allow the words to flow over. And uh, I was just thinking as we were listening to it being read, it's a little bit like um, a tune or a track, a file that we listen to, we may not actually know the words, but we know what it's kind of driving at. We might have to go online to find out what the actual lyrics were. We might know some of them that just sort of come out of the music a bit from here and there. Um, but we associate it with a feeling, perhaps, a place. And we know what the, the song means for us, if you like, even if the actual words in the song don't necessarily mean exactly the same thing. We might not know them. There might be a bit confusing. They might be a bit mystical. Song of Solomon. I uh, went to a Bible study week in uh, Sarum College in Salisbury, and uh, I had the privilege of sitting at the feet of a man who had made this, not his entire life's work, but it was a little bit like those people who have uh, train sets in their attic. He used to repair back to his uh, office and do a little bit more work on Song of Songs um, when he wasn't doing anything else. And so he'd been sort of meditating on it for much of his adult life. 
and uh, he taught it to us in three sections over those four or five days. And the first day, first section, the first way he interpreted it was as an erotic love poem. Um, he invited us to look at pictures of the human form, to enjoy food and drink, art, smell, imagery during that first exploration. And it is an ancient um, sort of, what's the word? Uh, shepherd-based erotic love poem. And it is entirely feasible, acceptable to understand it as such. We might think that's a bit of an odd thing to have in Scripture, but uh, God, in, to my mind, blesses us with our physical nature and in many respects, for many of us, that experience, when it is right and proper and true, can be amongst the most glorious of our human experiences. Clearly, the equal and opposite is also true. It can be the most damaging, hurting and uh, difficult, frustrating and uh, challenging, angst-ridden aspect of who we are as people. But to have this poem there, and we can interpret it as lewdly, to my mind, as we like, if we are reading it as that sort of poem. But that's just one strand, one chord. Another strand or chord is actually the idea of the temple. And if you read about the building of the temple, the instructions for the temple, it was designed to look as much like where God is as possible. And uh, one construct of that is the Garden of Eden. And so there are pomegranates, um, which are fleshly, um, sensual, um, there are vines, likewise, intoxicating from their fruit, the, the juice made of their fruit, clad in gold, smells of, we don't, I don't, don't think we had anything here about, oh yes, they give forth fragrance, but elsewhere in the Song of Songs there's a development of the idea of um, incense, gold, frankincense, myrrh, would have been smells, sensations that people experience in worshipping God, which is one reason some say why it's in that hymn, O Worship the Lord and the Beauty of Holiness, uh, and those sort of uh, epiphany season hymns, because they're expressions of worship. And um, the temple for the Hebrew people was this awesome, a bit like us coming out of our mud huts into this extraordinary building um, in years gone by with this extraordinary size, shape, high roof, permanence about it uh, with these images painted on the roof. It would have been an expression of awe and wonder. And as a Hebrew religious text, Song of Songs also stands. So when I did that course, the second chunk section was looking at it as um, upholding the God of the Jew in all that beauty, delight and tenderness having also originally thought about it as this erotic love poem. So there are two chords. And then the third and final, as Christians, we read it and we see Jesus in that. Those of you who are interested in uh, mystical expressions and experiences of faith um, from the saints, sometimes, sadly, it's because women have been abused by men and uh, not been allowed to eat, and equally men abused by men and uh, taken to the very edge of uh, what they can sustain in terms of lack of food and determination to make people stand in the sea for hours on end and uh, to pray all hours that God sends. People can be reduced to that sort of liminal point between life and death, but there in prayer and worship, they have extraordinary, almost erotic experiences of God. Your soul pierced my heart. Ideas of Jesus dying on the cross and his blood falling on them. And extraordinary poetry of intensity, of an experience of Jesus. And we understand Jesus as an expression of God, loving us, being with us, holding us, physicality of God's presence with us. We know that because God is with us, that we belong to God and God to us. My beloved is mine and I am his. He pastures his flock among the lilies. Whilst we might not have the word lilies in uh, the psalm that we know and love, the Lord is my shepherd, that idea of God pasturing us as flock, caring for and looking after us, is just one of the myriad layers, facets of this fascinating poetry and book of wisdom. And so however we want to engage with those strands, there are some that say it is one and it isn't the other, but I put it to you that there is truth in all of those ideas in relation to that poem. 
And it's no wonder that we are drawn to love and to worship and to praise. And finally, very much down to earth, a uh, letter um, from Peter to the churches. We know that we come down from this mountaintop experience of sitting in this wonderful building and we get back to our families and our friends and our neighbours, the challenge of sorting out our electricity bill, working out where we're next going to, how we're going to afford our holiday or our meal, how we're going to get our passport, how we're going to care for our children or our parents, the nitty-gritty of every day, and things can become more difficult as Jesus coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration suddenly gets caught up in a healing and a restoration of challenging behaviour and difficulty within a household. May it be our prayer as we go from here today that our experiences of wonder and awe and worship will enable us to be serious and disciplined, to be loving each to the other, to recognise the moment if we are able to step away, count to ten and come back, isn't actually all there is to life. May we understand that actually everything we say and do, we say and do as it were to God, that God may be glorified in all things. And may we not be surprised, yes, I know that Peter is writing to people who are being persecuted because of their faith, as many of our um, Christian, uh, those that share our faith, are persecuted around the world today. But even in some small way, we might try to take a stand because of a truth as we understand it, over and against a family decision or something in our street or in our club or society that others disagree with. It doesn't matter if we do this or that, and we say, well, actually, I'm afraid I'm going to have to disagree because I think we should do such and such. People may turn aside and turn away. But Peter writes, let us not consider that to be unusual, strange, unexpected. But rather, may we be glad and shout for joy, or we'll prepare to be glad and shout for joy when God's glory is revealed, because we understand we are suffering in this present time because of that. I guess it's a little bit like those of us who are struggling with a knitting pattern, going back to the um, train set. There will come a time or a point or a place where we are judged for our giant marrow or whatever it is, and all the efforts and bother that we're putting into it now, all those... Uh, Late nights, early mornings, those, uh, the dieting, the um, exercise, whatever it is that we're putting in, the challenge, the hurt and the pain of now will one day be vindicated and we will be pleased in the end so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. Amen.